Okay, good afternoon, learners. Hope you're doing well. Today we have to start with the remaining portion of block three, which would be, I think, motivation, because we finished off with direction yesterday and leadership. So I'm starting to present and uh, I hope the co-hosts will do their job and uh, we should not have any problem in admitting learners into the meeting. Sorry, this is not the file that we want. Please confirm if the file is visible to you. Yes, madam. Yes, please. Yes, doctor, it is. Okay, okay, thank you. All right. If you recall, yesterday we were looking at a topic which is which is a very interesting topic, leadership. We looked at some theories of leadership and a couple of other subtopics related to leadership. Um, a topic very closely connected with leadership is called motivation. And um, we are going to look at that topic today. Now, what do we understand by motivation? Look, uh, uh, another thing I wanted to add before we start off with the presentation is that today is our last day of academic counseling. So we would go a little fast since there are a couple of topics more in the unit number four, in the block number four. And there's some part already uh, remaining of block three. And towards the end of it, if, it's some, if something else is remaining, we would see how we are, uh, you know, we would be in a position to cover. Right. So the topic for today is motivation. Now, there are two things about motivation. One is it can be looked at as a noun. The second is it can also be looked at as a verb. So what is a noun? It is something existing. And what is a verb? It is something that we do. So what is motivation? The first definition. Uh, could you please uh, mute yourself? I think uh, there would be a clashing and echo sound. All of you, please mute yourselves. Okay, so the first definition of motivation, which describes what is motivation is all forces operating within an individual to cause him or her to engage in certain kinds of behavior. So this is something which is existing within individuals, existing within us. It indicates a drive in us to do something, to achieve some goal, right? It could be anything. It could be channeled in any manner, in any way. But then, yes, some driving force, something which you know, motivates us, something which tells us to do something, to engage in certain kinds of behavior, that is motivation. And the second definition of motivation, again, the um, as equally important to an organization, is the process of channeling a person's inner drives so that he wants to accomplish the goal. So one, we need to know what kind of motivations people have, what forces are working within them. And second, we need to turn those motivations we do need to channel those motivations in a position, in a direction where they want to accomplish the goals of the organization. And when would that happen? That would happen when they see the goals of the organization as leading to their own personal goals. When they see that, they are going to accomplish work towards accomplishing the goals of the organization. Now, 
let's come to the nature of motivation. What do we understand? Since this is a psychological thing, since this is something which is intangible, since this is something which is inside the individual, and sometimes uh, it is very complex to understand, we need to put down some points here about the nature of motivation. Nature of motivation, number one point, individuals differ, differ in their motivation. So people might be doing the same kind of work, but the motivations inside them, the reasons behind what, uh, behind that work would be, would be different. Second point, sometimes individuals themselves are not aware of their motivations. So we might do certain things, not understanding the reason behind them. It's always possible that we are not aware of our own motivations. We might engage in certain kinds of behavior, we might do certain things, but we might, we might not be aware that, you know, we are doing those things. Or we might not be aware of the reason behind those things, those activities. Motivations are dynamic. So today, if you are motivated to some extent, tomorrow you might be motivated to a greater extent to do something. Today, you're motivated to achieve a particular goal. Tomorrow, you'll be motivated to achieve some other goal. So motivations change because they are directly very closely connected to what kind of needs we have. So the moment our needs change, the moment we view them as different, our motivation levels change, right? Secondly, even if people have the same motivations, have you know, have the same goals, motivations may be dif expressed differently. Some people might, like for example, if you want to achieve a, um, you know, achieve achieve a positive goal. Positive goal would be some some kind of a uh, positive thing which you want to achieve in life you people would take different pathways to achieve that a simple example if you want to achieve good results in the examinations some people might study hard some people might do some smart work some people might you watch youtube youtube channels some people might look at the study material very in, in, in you know very um, comprehensively and because of all these things a one more point which is not written over here is that motivations are related to personal factors. So personal factors are what? Personal factors are psychological factors, our um, demographics, our backgrounds, our education, our families, our genetics. All those things are personal factors. Could be psychological and otherwise also. So all those things basically cause, influence motivations. So mot that is the reason motivations are complex. They are difficult to understand. It becomes all the more difficult then to understand why people behave in an organization in a particular manner. So that is why studying motivation is so important. Determinants of motivation in an organization, we've already explained some of them. How and why a person in an organization behaves in a particular manner or what is the behavior that he displays, you know, under different circumstances. It's dependent on a number of factors. These are all determinants of motivation. One, individual, there's some typo here, so I couldn't correct it because it's a PDF. Individuals differ in their attitudes, beliefs, value systems, personalities, backgrounds, that is what we said. Since individuals have different components of their personalities, motivation becomes a factor which is influenced by, <laughs> differently by different individuals. The climate of the organization. Could you please mute yourself? Who is this? Please, I request you to please mute yourself. Abdul Qadir Abbas Zakar, please mute yourself. Please, please mute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so individuals are determinants of motivation in an organization because they come from different variety of, they bring in variety of, you know, things with them, personal characteristics, psychological characteristics, backgrounds. The organizational climate also de is a determinant of motivation in an organization. Sometimes the climate is very stifling. Sometimes the climate is very positive, very energetic. So that also influences the motivation levels of people in the organization. The amount of autonomy given to people, that influences because human beings want to be independent. Human beings, if you remember theory why, human beings want to work, human beings want to be independent. They don't want to be always ordered about. They want their own freedom. They want to use initiative. All those things, all those positive uh, 
needs are there as far as organize, people in the organization are concerned. So the more autonomy there is, the more motivation level. If there is conflict, lesser amount of motivation in the organization. If there's too much of control, less motivation. Exogenous variables, some variables are not belonging to the organization. They are outside the organization. So if an individual is sitting in the organization for quite some time, for eight hours, 10 hours, he's working in the organization, but the remaining number of hours, he's going outside the organization to his family, to his place. So whatever happens outside, possibly that can also influence the motivation level of an individual in the organization. Got it? Let us come to types of motivation. These are very easy topics, so we are going a little fast, as I said. Types of motivation. Now, motivation can be classified on a variety of ways. There are two majorly here. Positive and negative motivation and punishment also is a part of motivation and monetary and non-monetary. So whenever the organization wants to motivate people in an individual, in an organization, they would either use positive motivation or use negative motivation. Or if they want to um, put a stop to some negative behavior in the organization, they will use punishment. Similarly, if they want to, you know, get work done, they might show some things to the individuals, those things which they would achieve if they are, uh, you know, achieving results in the organizations. They can be monetary and non-monetary, which is related to the money economic aspect or not related to the economic aspect. We will not go into details of this, but I would definitely last, like to ask your question. Do you understand the difference between positive and negative motivation? Yes. Yes, yes, Dr. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So positive is when you add something positive to get the work done. Yeah. Negative is when you remove some negative element. When you show that you are going to remove some negative element to encourage the positive behavior, that is negative motivation. And punishment is for a negative behavior, right? Okay. Now let's run through the theories of motivation. One we had already mentioned, if you remember that when we were talking about the um, the management theories, the the history of management in the beginning of the uh, session, it was called Abraham Maslow's need hierarchy theory. If you remember, I will just I can't change this figure now. Anyway, the, uh, the the need hierarchy theory says that individuals have a variety of needs. Some are satisfied, some are not satisfied. The motivation start motivation of an individual starts from the unsatisfied needs of that individual, something which he wants, he or she wants. So whatever is not there with the individual for that, they would start working or they would be moving towards that goal. And once the need is satisfied, it will lose its motivational power. Right. These are the five levels of um, needs, according to the hierarchy of needs, physiological needs at the bottom. Safety needs, belongingness and love needs, estimate, esteem needs, and then self-actualization. Okay. I think you must have gone through this earlier. Have you gone through this earlier? Would you want me to elaborate? I think it is good enough, very, very um, clear enough here that if the safety needs are not uh, fulfilled, then the individual will work towards the safety needs. Safety would could mean not just physical safety. It could mean safety of the job, safety of life and uh, financial security. It could mean anything. So whatever is not there with the individual, that need wouldn't you know motivate that individual to work towards achieving that. So whoever gives, whoever is willing to satisfy those needs, they would start working for those conditions or for that organization, right? The second theory of motivation <clears throat> is Hertzberg's two-factor two theory. <clears throat> Excuse me. According to Herzberg, there are two sets of factors. One set of factors are called motivators or satisfiers. And the other set of factors are called hygiene factors. In, this, in a sense that whatever is influencing an individual in the workplace can be easily put into two parts. One are the motivators, the other are the hygiene factors. The other set are the hygiene factors. The hygiene factors are those factors which if they are not there, they cause dissatisfaction in the individual. If they are there, it does not cause satisfaction. They expect it to be there. 
the motivating factors are those factors which would lead to motivation or satisfaction in individuals if they are present in their organization. If they are not there, they might lead to dissatisfaction. Now, how do you, this was in, this was, you know, the, the, uh, a very old theory, but how do you put it to, to, into practice today? Let's look at some of the maintenance factors, job security, good working conditions, fair policies, good relationships with the supervisor and colleagues. These are all maintenance factors. Because this you expect. Okay. Opportunity to accomplish something, opportunity to grow, a recognition in the organization, the job itself, chances for re increased responsibility. These are all motivators. So if they are present, the individual is motivated to work. And if they are not present, the individual is dissatisfied. Okay. Can you tell me, would these conditions, would these factors change? over a period of time. Or is there a difference possibly if you look at uh, the practices in the industry 20 years back and, uh, and, and right now, wherever we are, whatever part of the world we are from, do you feel there is some kind of a change in the kind of factors which are there possibly today? Okay, I'll answer the question. We need to save time. The more facilities the organizations start providing, the reason could be anything. Maybe because of development of the economy, maybe because of the growth of the organizations, maybe because of the education levels, whatever. The more facilities the organizations provide, the more factors would, would come into the hygiene factor category. So personal growth possibly wasn't was a was a sad, uh, was a motivator maybe 20 years from now but today everyone is wanting personal growth in the organization so if it is not there possibly people will become dissatisfied those could be the hygiene factors so you know it is a growth it is a continuum a lot of factors are being taken for granted a lot of factors are expected to be the be in their environment be provided by the uh, employer and slowly this the, the this is a dynamic thing right <clears throat> let us come to the third theory which is called the mclean's need for achievement theory <clears throat> now what are we looking at actually we are looking at the different theories of motivation we are looking at these theories to understand why people are motivated and in what manner they are motivated so McLean's need for achievement theory says that there are three important needs which exist in individuals. And these three needs are need for affiliation, need for power, and need for achievement. What is need for affiliation? <clears throat> need for affiliation is the need to be interacting with people, have having good relations with people, and having friendships harmony in the workplace that is need for affiliation need for power is need for control in the organization need for dominancy in the organization need for achievement is task oriented need for achievement means that whatever position an individual is in he or she would the first priority for that person is to complete whatever task they have so people can vary in their needs for affiliation, for power, and for achievement. Anyone who has, and they can be, and if we are able to understand what is the dominant need in an individual, we can also understand what kind of job that person will be able to do. So a person who has high need for affiliation can work in the front office very well, can work in customer service very well, can work in counseling very well. Okay? Need for power, someone who has a dominant need for power can work where there is a lot of pressure and control is required. Need for achievement is the best kind of need actually, which is not influenced by people nor it's influenced by personal uh, requirement of power. So a person who's need, who's high in need for achievement should be a better manager. Clear? I'm 
I'm not hearing yes. any response. Today. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. The fourth need is, I'm sorry, not the need. The fourth theory is Victor Vroom's expectancy theory. According to this theory, under conditions of free choice, <clears throat> an individual is motivated towards an activity which is which he is most capable of rendering and which he believes has the biggest highest probability of leading him to his most preferred goal now that is complex kind of a statement but let us explain that with an example for example one individual in the organization wants to be promoted he wants a promotion right now that is the most preferred goal his boss can give him a promotion okay because bosses give promotions to individuals now if that individual thinks that he is able to perform his the task which has been allocated to him very well he is capable he has the ability to do it and if he believes that he will and he also believes that if he does the work well the promotion the boss will give him, give him the promotion so he has to have that belief also that if he works well, number one, he's capable of working, uh, achieving the, uh, you know, the task, completing the task in time. He also believes that if he completes the task on time, he will, the boss will promote him. What will he do? He will complete, he will try to, he will be motivated to complete that task on time because he believes on, in, in the, in his beliefs are related to these two things. Suppose he believes that he is not able, he will not be able to complete the task, but he wants a promotion. And he believes that if he gives some, you know, under the table or if he follows some practices which are, which are, uh, you know, away from working and he, and he believes that the boss will be influenced and give him a promotion he will go ahead and do that thing so what an individual believes to be his capacity and his belief that his capacity or his working will lead to a goal will ensure that that person starts working towards that goal otherwise it becomes difficult for him to see the relationship between his working and the goal okay Next theory, Adam's equity theory. <clears throat> According to Adam's equity theory, before we come to the explanation of what is written over here, Adam's equity theory says that if we believe that we have been given, we have got a proper output, proper result, proper reward for what we have done, we will for the kind of effort that we have put in. We compare this effort with the efforts of someone else. That is what is equity. What is equity defined as? Equity is defined as the ratio between the individual's job inputs and job rewards compared to the rewards others are receiving for similar jobs. So if we believe equity is there, there will be motivation, there will be performance, and there will be satisfaction. If we believe no equity is not there, someone else is getting uh, better rewards for doing the same kind of work, we will stop working. Okay, so an individual's motivation, performance, and satisfaction will depend on his subjective evaluation of his effort and reward ratio to that of others in similar situations. Is that clear to you, all of you? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, madam. Yes, the next theory is Skinner's behavior modification theory. Skinner's behavior modification theory is basically based on the reinforcement theory, you know. People behave the way they do because they have learned that certain behaviors are associated with positive outcomes 
and certain behaviors are associated with unpleasant outcomes. With experience, when they are working in the organization, every organization has a different setup. Every organization has a different climate. Every organization has a different um, culture. And people observe these things when they are in the organization. And they start believing certain things. And they start, start associating certain behaviors with positive outcomes and start associating certain behaviors with negative outcomes. And when they see this relationship, this conditioning happens to them. When they see this relationship, then they, you know, behave accordingly. Okay. The next topic that we are going to look at in brief is the motivation techniques, which we discussed above. So monetary, the motivation techniques, as we looked at uh, in the, you know, pages above was monetary and the, there's a division by uh, of motivation techniques into monetary and non-monetary. And what are monetary? The salary, profit sharing options, stock options, bonus, which is given by a lot of companies, commission if it's some kind of sales or some kind of uh, job like that, productivity linked incentives, depends on, on how much production we have uh, achieved, retirement benefits. These are all monetary or economic. Sometimes the organization also uses, not sometimes, nowadays, most organizations use non-monetary because they don't have to spend money on that. The status or rank or position, career advancement opportunities, job enrichment. Now, job enrichment, I think you have an HR subject, so you must have come across that word. Job enrichment would mean adding elements to our job, which make them more interesting and satisfying and challenging. So that is job enrichment. Job security, security of the job, right? Autonomy, like we said, autonomy is a very valued um, cultural element. And employee recognition. These are all non-monetary, non-monetary motivation techniques. That brings us, no, no, yes, this is one more topic left. That brings us to the end of motivation. And there's another small uh, unit in block three, which is decision making. We will run through some of the um, parts of this unit so that we are conceptually clear with the important things in the unit. What is a decision? Decision is a choice between two or more alternatives. We know that for the purpose of solving a problem or seeking a solution. And like we discussed earlier, Decision making is an integral part of a manager's job. Actually, if you look at it that way, the only thing that the manager does in an organization is make decisions. Okay. Let us come to the types of decisions. <clears throat> uh, let me look at some of the chat messages. In, I think there's some. some questions shall we take these questions at the end or i'll just look at them right now okay the first question the is uh, at the at end? end okay the okay end. we'll look at them we'll look at them at the end then so let's continue with the right so types of decisions types of decisions managers have to take in their workplace okay as with the case of other similar functions, they can also be classified in a, in, a, in a variety of ways. So decisions can be programmed in the decisions in the organization with the, which the managers have to take can be programmed and non-programmed. Now, what is programmed and what is non-programmed? Programmed decisions are made in accordance with some existing policy rule. They are routine and repetitive. For example, rules for leaves, salary slabs, something which routinely happens in the organization, daily work, or, you know, on a regular basis, it could be monthly decisions also, whatever. But these decisions are those decisions which have already been taken some time earlier. So we don't have to actually at the at, at this moment in time, look at all the alternatives available and then take a decision, evaluate all the alternatives and then take a decision. We don't have to do that. So program decisions are already existing. There are guidelines to how to take those decisions. That is there. Non-program decisions are made in novel and non-repetitive situations. 
So a certain problem arises and a tailor-made solution needs to be taken, right? Then it is a non-programmed decisions. Examples could be resource allocation, not location, allocation, or some kind of strategy development, some kind of um, target not being achieved, some kind of a threat in the, in, in the environment, some kind of an opportunity in the environment. For all these situations, non-programmed Obviously, program decisions, since they're already there in the system, they're not important. Managers' effectiveness is judged by the ability to make non-programmed decisions. And as we move up, move up the hierarchy in an organization, the frequency of taking non-programmed decisions increases. And as we move downwards in the organization, obviously, they have to take more of programmed decisions. Decisions can also be major and minor. So that's a simple classification. If the decision involves a long range impact, then it is a major decision. It could maybe be a small thing, but it decides the future. There is some long range impact of that decision. It is a major decision. If the decision or the area where the decision is being taken has an impact on other functional areas, like the HR policies or something in the budget, it has a it is a major decision. Decisions about qualitative factors, which influence the image, the philosophy, the the culture in the organization, those could be qualitative factors, and if these are going to impact the organization majorly, they are major decisions. If a decision is to be made on a, on a recurring basis, a repetitive basis, then it is a minor decision. Okay. Now, this same decision, the same classification can be converted into another terminology, which is routine and strategic decisions. Routine decisions are programmed decisions. We'll come back later. Routine decisions are focused on present small operational tasks. These decisions are made keeping in view the existing policies on a day-to-day -day basis by the lower level management. And strategic decisions are made by the high levels of the management. Okay. So if you if you try to combine all three all these three classifications, we can safely say that programmed decisions are generally minor decisions and routine decisions. Non-programmed decisions are generally major decisions and strategic decisions. Right? Another classification which involves the number of people uh, taking the decision is individual and group decisions. Group decisions, you must be knowing that are majorly beneficial than individual, de individual decisions because of increased acceptance, easier coordination, more information processing, easier communication, better decisions and simple, simple and complex is a classification. I'm sorry, it has to be um, in a different format, but it's by mistake. It's the, so better decisions when you are doing your, when you're taking group decisions, disadvantages to group decisions, simple and complex can be added again to the four, four classifications that we've already had something which is programmed is simple is minor and is um, not a strategic decision. Okay. What are the disadvantages of a, of a group decision? Definitely there can be some, dis everything has its own disadvantages and advantages. So a group decision is slower because there are a lot of people involved. Sometimes can involve compromises. They can get together. The group can get together and make some compromises after mutual discussion. Sometimes group decisions are dominated by powerful members. If there is a boss or a superior or someone who has more authority, maybe conferred authority or otherwise is more has more expertise, that person can dominate the group and, you know, tweak the decisions. Over-reliance on group decisions may inhibit managers' ability to take fast decisions. So if every time the manager is into group decision making, sometimes when faster decisions need to be made, the manager might not be able to you know, put, uh, take the decision on time. <clears throat> I think you can um, go through the methods of group decision making. That will be going through, going into too much of detail here. But Briefly, let us look at what it is. Brainstorming is when you try to bring up a lot of alternatives. 
a lot of people are involved in brainstorming and they are they are you know they they are given a free run as to how to solve the, how, how to solve a particular problem and they are supposed to generate a lot of alternatives and those alternatives are later on discussed similarly nominal group technique is also like that but in, in the nominal group technique earlier they are not um, they are not inhibited by you know having a group discussion in the beginning they have given some um, you know, some you know alone time to actually think of the solution and and uh, propose think of the problem and propose solutions delphi technique i suppose is a, <clears throat> a long distance technique similar manner focus groups are when 8 to 10 people are told to sit together given a given a given a situation or a problem and uh, the discussions are more detailed and more focused onto the problem okay there is another part of this topic which is which has to look at the models the economic man model the bounded rationality model so the models of decision making the number one model of decision making is the economic man model which believes that man is completely economically rational economically rational so therefore will attempt to maximize the economic outcomes in an orderly and sequential process will choose the best alternative possible after logically analyzing all options so what does it say you want to buy a car okay if you believe in this model then you have a problem where you want to buy a car you want to you know choose the best option available the problem starts there only you want to analyze all the models which are there in the world so if you have a budget of somewhere around 8 to 10 lakhs or 3 to 7 lakhs then you are going if you believe in this model or if you actually you know <clears throat> i'm not saying that you believe in this model if the, is this model is actually applicable then this individual will look at all the options available in in the whole world which would possibly you know uh, offer him a car within the budget that person has and then he or she this person would evaluate and analyze all the or all these alternatives on the basis of the criteria that he has built so is it possible it is not possible so this is not a realistic view as man does not have the ability to gather all information mentally store that information or in fact do it on the computer even yes is accurately recall or information make all possible calculations to find out how much is the average how much is the you know after service um, facility available what is the costing what are the features x y z everything it is not humanly possible and then rank all possible alternatives on the basis of merit before taking a decision so economical economic man model says that an individual can take a decision after evaluating or after collecting all information and after evaluating all possible possible alternatives and then also make calculations and do and so there will be one you know um, resulting alternative out of the whole process but this is not feasible this is not feasible that is not possible okay so a slightly moderate or slight, slightly more possible kind of a um, model is there which says which is called the bounded rationality model by herbert simon according to this model man gathers enough alternatives and information enough means enough means when he feels it is enough so if you are going to buy a car between 3 and 4 3 and 7 uh, like i'm not sure you must be having different currencies so i'm talking about india so if you if you want to if you want a car with falls within this budget and the limited amount of features that you've possibly thought of which you've already decided you would be you know you would come down to a limited choices number of choices which you would possibly want to evaluate and after evaluating those 5 10 choices uh, you would make a decision so man gathers enough alternatives and information search is on only until he is satisfied so he might think that look now i have enough options and i let me take a decision from there from those uh, options so he is guided by past memory and experience that is the most that is the first most information source that we actually use okay and then he takes a decision right what's the next theory it says it is the social man 
Social man theory says that people make decisions on the basis of emotions and instincts. It is driven by unconscious desires, by social pressures, and this is an irrational decision. But sometimes irrationality is rational. How? If you want to buy a gift for a family member, for your parents, there you are not going to actually look at all the rational things. Possibly you know that the person, the person to with who, for whom you are going to buy the gift, is likes a particular color or likes something, and you would possibly go ahead and you know whatever gift uh, you would the gift would be according to the tastes of that individual. So there, in this social man man angle comes in. So like with all the other concepts of management, you know these models or theories they are not complete and not. You know, any one theory is not complete. The complete understanding of the topic comes after studying all those theories. And that is how the field has grown. Okay. There's one more topic left of this top, you know, one more subtopic left here, which is steps in rational decision making. <clears throat> now, we were talking about decision making. And... Uh, we are talking about rational decision making now. So, and we have, you know, taken that concept from the bounded rationality model. And this is basically the process which is followed while taking a decision. It's not possible that, you know, it's sometimes all these steps are not there. You might skip a step, possibly. But yes, in general, these, these are the steps which are uh, taken in rational decision making model. One is recognizing the problem. Deciding priorities among problems. Third, diagnosing the problem. Developing alternative courses of action. Measuring and comparing consequences of alternatives. And converting the decision into effective action and follow-up. We would look at these steps with, a, with an example. Now, what example should we take? Let's look at why you have joined the MBA program of IGNU. Suppose, suppose that's the how it started. You're working in an organization and uh, you, you, the chances of growth you feel at the moment, according to what you have, what, what kind of uh, um, education or what kind of ability or um, whatever, you believe that you, know, you need to do something about a problem which is existing. That problem is growth in the organization that you're working in. So you, you've started realizing that you know, there is no growth at the moment. That is the problem. You might have other problems also. You might have some possibly, uh, you may not know computer science. I mean, you know, you may not know to use the computer um, softwares that are there in the organization in which you're working. You might have some health problems. You might have some family problems. Uh, you might have some social conflict, X, Y, Z. You might have a lot of problems. Everyone has. <coughs> but when you're talking of your work life in the organization, you will decide about the priorities among those problems. The first priority, for example, when you have a lot of problems, you will decide the priority. And you would feel that you the growth, which is not there, what you know, I'm not growing in the organization, that is my biggest problem. Let me do something about it. So you come, you're not growing in the organization, come to the third step, you diagnose the problem, you look at around you, you look at the other people who are around you, you start understanding exactly why you're not growing and others are possibly growing. So you understand that you need to have a degree, a postgraduate degree in, uh, um, in, a, in an area where, uh, which will help you grow. So that is diagnosis. You understood that you have, need to have a postgraduate degree. Now, developing alternative courses of action. You need a postgraduate degree, but what kind of degree? You can go in for um, uh, uh, you know, MSc. If you're into, if your, if your, if your organization is into computer science or X, Y, Z, whatever field it is, there could be a PG degree associated with it, with that, with that uh, field. Uh, you can go in for a vocational course. You can go in for a, a, for a course which is a short-term course or a long-term course or an MBA program. So you have a lot of variety of alternatives. So in your mind, at the moment, right now, in your mind, what you'll do is you'll compare the consequences of the alternatives which are there. And you might, you felt, you felt that, you know, doing an MBA program would be a much better option rather than the other options. 
So what have you done? You have converted, you have compared the alternatives and you have converted that decision into effective action by deciding not, you have not reached the action right now. By deciding that you want an MBA program, you want to do an MBA program. But this decision itself will give you give rise to another problem. How? New problem, which says, from where do I do this MBA program? Okay, so now you've gone to step number one again. The problem is, where do I do how many, from where do I get this? Um, you will not possibly go to step number one, you will go to step number four again. Fair, you would start deciding from where you can do your MBA program. You possibly have a local university, you have other online universities, you have other international universities, other national universities, whatever is available at your end. You have a lot of alternatives. You measured, you compared, you, you, you evaluated the alternatives on the basis of a lot of criteria that you have on the basis of a lot of information that you have. You have information from your own friends, you have information from the web, you have information from you know, a lot of sources. You have criteria. You have criteria as, criteria as to how much time you are going to spend. You have criteria as to how much money you're going to spend. Depending on all that, you measured and compared all the, all the, all the alternatives. And then you decided that you want to go ahead for an MBA online program from the Indira Gandhi National Open University. Got it? Similarly, the rational decision-making process in the organization will work. Problem recognition is as important as developing courses of action. Problem rec recognition is not that easy in an organization. Sometimes you know that there is a problem, but you do not know what is the cause behind it. Okay, so that finishes the decision-making part of block number three and after a two minute break we will come back and start the fourth block and run through it and then take questions is it clear to you till now all of you yes ma'am yes it is clear yeah, yeah ma'am you can proceed thank you thank you yes, we, ma we are take... thank you We'll take two minutes off and then come back. Yes, we are here. All right, that's good. Thank you.
Okay, I'm back and uh, we would start with the fourth block. Everyone there? We are here, ma'am. Yes, we are here. Okay, so the fourth block starts yes. with uh, unit 10, which talks of the unit, uh, which talks of organization, structure and design. Some part of this unit we've already covered when we were talking of, when we were discussing uh, the organization process. Okay. Now, today we have to discuss how, what is an organization structure and what is the, what is the design element which we had not discussed earlier in the organizing function. The process of organization involves creating departments, if you remember. There was a process of organization which talked of deciding, looking at the objectives, deciding the activities, dividing the activities into departments, deciding the key activities, deciding the span of management, also deciding centralization and decentralization, and then remaining part of the organization process, right? So the departmentation thing, how departments are created, that is related directly to the organization structure. So we are going to look at the departmentation as the starting point of the unit. Horizontal differentiation of tasks or activities, which have been decided that they are required to achieve the organizational objectives into discrete segments is known as departmentalization. The aim of departmentalization is to take advantage of division of labor and specialization. So there are several bases of departmentalization. It depends on the needs of the organization and uh, the basic activities which are to be conducted in the organization. And we are aware, we are familiar with most of the depart, depart, departmentation basis. One is functional departmentation. When we divide the organization on the basis of the different functions which are carried out, most common ones being marketing, finance, HR, person, HR and production. This is in general. Production units will have different. They would have production. They would have Q&A. They would have purchase. They would have packing. Okay. So on the basis of functions, on the basis of major activities which are being done, if the organization is divide, divided into departments, it's called functional departmentalization. This is widely used because it's very easy to divide departments on the basis of similar activities. And we have a number of advantages and some disadvantages because of using a functional departmentalization. Simple form of grouping, everyone can understand. I know my coworker is doing the same work. I'm also doing the same work. So simple form of grouping. People on tasks feel secure. You know, they can ask for help from each other because they, everyone's doing the same kind of work. Development of expertise, because same kind of work being done over and over again by the same set of people in the department will lead to expertise. Everyone would know you know, how to improve the efficiency in the department. Improve planning and control and economy. Obviously economy, because everything, all equipments, all the requirements are there. And because of division of labor and specialization, productivity is more. That is why there is economy. Negative, sub-goal loyalties. Overall training of managers is not possible because if the manager is only looking after production, he might not get exposed to other functions of the organization not suitable for large, complex, di geographically distributed organizations with large number of products. Because there, then we will use other forms of departmentalization. For, a, for an organization which has a large number of products, like we were discussing about all the big consumer durable companies, all the bigger companies which are into a wide variety of products, there the product departmentalization is used. It is used when large organizations with extensive product range and number of successful products Product departmentalization is used. Why do we do it? Because individual attention is required. Raw material, infrastructure, expertise for all the products are different. So separate semi-autonomous units are created where all facilities are assembled. All facilities related to that product are assembled. Okay. So if it's a, if it's a television unit manufacturing firm, all, all raw materials related to that uh, product will be there. All people, all expertise, all, all technology will be only that 
uh, only only related to that product. And then what is the advantages? Attention to the product. As team is focused on only one product or product line, it relieves the top management of operating responsibility. That happens in the functional one also. Comparison among products is possible. So at the end of a, a, a time frame, uh, it is possible to find out what, how which product did better. Comparison is, is possible. Responsibility and motivation is also here. because you know if when you are when you are responsible for one unit, or one type of product, and you are you know that you've been you you would be compared with the other product. Your performance will be compared with the performance of the other product team. So you would more become more responsible and be motivated to achieve good results. Negative is duplication of staff facilities. Why? Because the accounts team will be here only with this product also, and the accounts team will also be there with the other products. Under utilization of certain resources, which possibly if the other products were there, could be properly utilized. Extra sales force, managerial person, everything extra required. Why? Because you are creating, if you remember, uh, no, this has not been with you. A big company, a big corporate is basically, and which is into different product lines, is divided into something called strategic business unit. So each strategic business unit is entirely autonomous uh, in terms of the other units. So they would have all staff, all facilities, all, you know, everything, all functions. They would have everything in that strategic business unit. So obviously there is going to be a lot of duplication and underutilization of certain resources when they are not being used by that team. When an organization is, you know, geographically distributed, regional departmentalization is used. So uh, an organization which is working in different parts of the country will have different regional offices. Why? Because they have to be closer to the customer, closer to the uh, requirements of that place. Only then they would be in a position to cater to the needs of that region. Advantages are adaptation to local and regional situations. Again, motivation to perform because it's different from the other regions. Top level training to regional heads is possible. It is only here because they are controlling the region with all the facilities. So they will get they would get to do strategic planning. They would get to take decisions for the whole organization of that region and then get that is if, and because of it, they will get training. Advantage of local factors, obviously, comparison among regions is possible, like in the case of products. Comparison among regions is also possible. Negatives again, duplication and competition. This is an important one. Departmentation on the basis of time. When there are facilities which need to be properly, optimally utilized, then departmentation on the basis of time is done, like the shift system in factories. So you have machinery. You cannot let the machinery rest for the 10 hours when the workers are not there in the night. So they have three shifts in the unit. The morning shift will be for eight hours. The evening shift will be for eight hours. And the night shift will be there for eight hours. In this system, you will be able to utilize the machinery for complete 24 hours. Right? The disadvantage is that accidental occurrences of breakage will be carried over from one shift to another shift. And since you are using the capacity of the plant, Continually, more breakage and wear and tear will be there. And sometimes it will be difficult to measure the performance because how would you note the productivity of the different shift of people? It becomes a little difficult. Process departmentalization is applicable where the process, the business process can be broken down into discrete parts like petroleum. Different parts of the process are done at different places. Advantages would be efficient use of equipment or machinery, little chance of underutilization. Why? Because only the equipment, the people, the process, whatever is required for that particular part of the job, of the process, only that is being kept there. So they are utilizing it completely. Principle of specialization is there. Negatives would be no ground for overall training as with some other functions, uh, uh, departmentalizations also. Process is interdependent. And like in the time uh, departmentalization, here the failures can carry over from one part of the process to the next part of the process. 
divisional structures. Large multi-product organizations follow combined bases, all the bases which, have, which we have discussed, you know, in the pages above. So some organization like, a, like Nestle possibly, since it's a big, huge organization, it will have a CEO, it will have different product lines, and the products will be headed by a unit head, which would have engineering and marketing and finance and personnel, all the departments. Okay. So those are called divisional structures. So Multi-product companies have big divisions. That brings us to the end of the departmentalization basis. Now, let us look at the result of organization. Let us look at the result of the departmentalization function. Okay, so when the whole process of organization is complete or it's towards, you know, we cannot say it is complete because all the management functions like we discussed are continuous. So the organization process is also continuous, but it will give a result after some time when the organization process starts over a period of time, it will result into something which is called the organization structure. The formal structural frame, framework of the organization, like something you know, to, to some extent, something like this. Where is the next thing here? More detailed. The formal structural framework of the organization is known as the organization structure. It is two-dimensional, horizontal, and vertical. Horizontal dimension depicts the departmentalization, like it was depicting product one, product two, product three. And vertical dimension refers to the hierarchy of authority relationships and how it flows. The formal organization is depicted by means of an organizational chart. So you have created the organization, but you have to put it down in writing in black and white so that people know where they stand. What are the authority relationships? Who is reporting to whom? What are the different levels of hierarchy? How is communication flowing? How is authority flowing? flowing? How is responsibility flowing in the organization? Right? So it is depicted by an organization chart. Do I have an example of that here? I don't have a figure here. I'll... You can please Google it and then see what an organization chart looks like. It some, looks some, somewhat like the Nestle chart that we had up in the in the pages above, but uh, it has to be more detailed. Okay, so organization chart is a formal depiction of the organization. So who is reporting to whom? All those all those all those relationships are there. It is depicted by arrows, okay, and rectangles. People positions stand for rectangles and the arrows tell us where the communication is flowing, how people are related to each other. The advantages of having an organization chart is that it, it equates everybody with the makeup divisions and size of the organization. It also shows the span of management at various levels, who is reporting to whom, how many people reporting to a superior. It helps analyze the balance of authority and responsibility relationships. Looking at the organization chart, at the organizational chart, you would be in a position to analyze that, you know, so many people are reporting to a particular individual with the task, which is very highly unstructured. So that person, that position will not be in a position to possibly do justice to the job. That kind of analysis can happen with the organizational chart. It helps identify deficiencies, if any. So when you do that analysis, these defi deficiencies of, of reporting and span of management and, you know, those things will be brought into the picture. Organization structures, you know, can be highly centralized and highly decentralized. And they can have a small span of management to a large span of management. And broadly, they can be classified into mechanistic and organic structures. Mechanistic organ organization uh, structures are pyramid shaped and very rigid. Communication generally flows from top to the bottom and has a narrow span of management. What exists in the government sector in all the countries all over the world is a mechanistic organization where there is rigidity, you know, uh, and uh, difficulty in actually maintaining the, what should I say, maintaining the flexibility in an organization, okay? Organic structures are flatter and have more free-flowing free communication. Most of the mo modern organizations are, and especially in some industries, are very organic. Like you talk of, especially the creative 
uh, advertising industry is very orga organic, fashion industry is very organic, uh, maybe the software industry is also very organic. So they have more free flowing communication, they have more flatter structures, more flexible kind of structures, changes are easily made in those kind of structures. The unit, unit number 11 is of block four is on uh, is about organizational communication processes. And as I understand, I think you have a subject completely dedicated to business communication. So whatever portion is in your syllabus here is most probably been covered, has, has most probably been covered by that business communication subject or will be covered by the business communication subject. But we will briefly go through this unit. OK. Communication, we know, is an exchange of facts, ideas, opinions, or emotions between two people. Communication is very important, reason being that without communication, no work will be done, no tasks will be accomplished, relationships would not be proper, all kinds of problems. Actually, communication is the one, one force which runs the whole world, not just an organization. Okay, forms of communication can be oral, written, and nonverbal. Oral is when you when you use the spoken word. Written is when you write it down. In organizations, also people have oral communication, written communication, and nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication is very important, but very few people pay attention to how to handle those communication elements. Types of communication in an organization can be formal and informal, both. So. Formal communication would mean the flow of communication between superior and subordinate. Uh, formal communication is something which is valid as far as the organization is concerned, which is uh, which is required as far as the organization is concerned. And it can be downward, upward, and horizontal. Downward is when it flows from the superior to the subordinate, and it directs, defines, informs, and administers rewards or punishments. Upward communication is from the subordinate to the superior. It gives feedback, brings forth grievances, generates suggestions, all those things. Horizontal communication is between the same level of people in the organization, and it helps in coordination between people in the organization. External communication is also there. That is also a formal communication, and it helps in image building. When you're releasing press releases, when you're um, holding press conferences, when you're publishing some data, your annual reports, whatever. These are building the image of the organization. It can be for gathering uh, market information. It can be both ways and dispersing information. OK? Informal, we talked of formal communication. Informal communication is grapevine, which is useful for the organization and rumor or gossip in general words, which is not useful for the organization. Grape, I suppose I, I am hoping that you know what is grapevine. Yes. OK. Explain more, madam. Grapevine, OK. Uh, what is a grapevine? You, you've seen a grapevine, possibly, how a grape <clears throat> wine grows in, 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 the, in the garden. It goes anywhere, OK? OK, or any wine for that matter. Now, grape wine is an informal form of communication wherein the managers depend on the underlying, you know, uh, information which is not brought to that person in a formal manner. Some information about what problems could be existing in the organization. You know, someone tells someone and then someone tells and that person tells another person and it, you know, goes around like that round and round and reaches the ears of the person who's responsible for solving that problem. So a lot of information can be gathered through grapevine also about the culture, about problems, about conflicts, about good things also in the organization, about um, personal problems of individuals also, okay, or about some kind of some kind of you know um, some kind of problem which needs to be handled, which is which is not clearly visible as far as formal organization is concerned. So grapevine is that kind of communication. When friends talk to each other, they pass on information. That information might be useful for the organization in that way. OK? I think you must be already aware of the process of communication. Generation of an idea leads 
to encoding encoding after the message is encoded it is transmitted through whatever channels are available to the person to whom the communication is directed that person receives it decodes it take action on it takes action on it and sends the feedback okay barriers of communication also i think it should be very clearly covered somewhere in the next syllabus semantic barriers are barriers related to the language so when people speak different languages in an organization that creates a problem when people understand the meanings of words and symbols differently that is a problem when people have a poor vocabulary again communication becomes a problem if people use technical language with a person who is not technically uh, knowledgeable it becomes a problem communication does not happen properly now, what is effective communication effective communication is when the idea is converted and sent to the person to whom that communication is meant he receives the idea in the same way in which it was originated then it is effective communication and barriers to communication basically ensure you know put a put a put some create some problems in between where a wherein the person is not able to identify is is able to understand what the idea was in the initial when it was originated when the communication was started so physical barriers could be noise physical blocks <clears throat> improper time if someone's in a hurry and you tell him some important thing he will not be in a position to you know recall that later on when it is required distance can be a problem inadequate information can also be a problem it can create problems uh, overloaded information say like too much of information i'm sorry this overload is happening in our classes now right too much of information i don't know whether you will be able to re, you know um retain most of it okay there could be some barriers which can be organizational barriers organizational rules and regulations or chain of command can create barriers non availability of communication means no method to give feedback to the superior that's a non availability wrong choice of channel hierarchical relationships where there is a very um, you know rigid kind of and there is a barrier in the sense of uh, ego you know those kind of things can create a problem psychological barriers selective perception and selective distortion you want to only listen to selective perception is when you are wanting to only perceive those things which you believe in so suppose if you feel that your superior is very egoistic and superior is very demanding superior is very controlling is very dominant and uh, you want to look at it that way only so he whatever information whatever uh, some some good information which comes to you possibly will be perceived as being you know um, an insult to yourself whereas he is actually giving you some kind of feedback on your performance so that is selective perception it could also be selective distortion when you distort the image distort the um, sorry communication in a way which does not lead to the actual idea being uh received by the person who's supposed to receive it oh, oh, oh. yeah premature evaluation when someone speaks to you you are actually having some ideas in your mind not listening properly and evaluate it before the complete information is given to you different comprehensions of reality people have their own perceptions and their perceptions can mar their comprehension of reality attitude of superiors if they are egoistic if they are problematic attitude of subordinates if they don't want to listen if they are careless poor listening ego emotions all these are problems which can create barriers to effective communication and if you have to ensure effective communication you have to use appropriate language proper channel effective listening feedback make use of body language synergistic environment has to be there if you, in the organization if people need to understand instructions and follow instructions and avoiding halo effect is avoiding too much of praise too much of devotion to someone i think that should complete the communication thing i have run through it very fast because it's already been covered as i said so let us come to topics which is which 
are not going to be covered by other subjects, not overlapping some way or the other. And here, the one of the most important topics, which is there in the block four, is organization culture. Now, organization culture actually is a result of a lot of things which are happening in the organization. Uh, I think we are clear till here. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes, we are following. Yes, we are following. Yes, madam, we're following. Yes, yes, madam, we're following. Yes, madam, we are there. Okay. So now this is a very important concept, and it's actually very important for the existence and performance of the organization also. So let us look at this. Organization culture is the basic pattern of shared assumptions values and beliefs considered to be the correct way of thinking about and acting on problems and opportunities facing the organization. That's the definition. But what is important here is, <clears throat> you know, as far as all the other functions are also concerned, we are talking of all those functions, while talking about all those functions, we say that, you know, if we have to be acting properly on on the threats and opportunities and achieving organizational goals we need to do this right what is important here what is separate from all the other functions that we are talking that we've already discussed is that the culture is a result or a pattern of assumptions values and beliefs in the organization right it defines what is important and what is unimportant in the company it can be thought of an organization's DNA, which is invisible to the naked eye, yet a powerful template that shapes what happens in the workplace. Now, we talked of DNA. We can talk of DNA of individuals also. What are we made up of? <clears throat> we are made up. Our personalities, what are we made up of? We are made up of uh, a lot of genetic factors, the kind of educations that we've had, the kind of experiences that we've had, the kind of uh, people who are around us, all those factors influence and impact us. And they have led to a certain kind of person that we are, our personalities. So organizations also have personalities. And their personalities, the organization's personalities, are in the assumptions, values, and beliefs that are held by the people of the organization. And they operate beneath the surface of the organization's behavior. They are not directly observed, yet their effects are everywhere. And people in the organization behave because of certain assumptions, values, and beliefs. And you can understand the culture of the organization by watching the behavior of the people. Okay, so it is the personality of the organization. And mind you, the personality of the organization is the most important entity, which ensures whether the people in the organization would be aligned with the organization's objectives, whether the society will view the organization as being, you know, as being useful to the society or otherwise. So it is the most important thing, which is which has to be developed by the organizations. What are assumptions? Assumptions represent the deepest part of the organization culture because they are unconscious and are taken for granted. Assumptions are shared mental models, the broad world views and theories in use that people rely on to guide their perceptions and behavior. So we all have our own assumptions and those assumptions on the basis of those assumptions, we look at the world. On the basis of assumptions, we, uh, you know, understand meanings of certain things which are happening around us. Belief represents the individual's perceptions of reality. So you may believe something, I may believe in the same manner, in the same, or oh, about a particular topic, I might believe differently. Values are more stable. 
and long lasting beliefs about what is important values tell us what is right or wrong good or bad we might have different values and we can't determine an organization's cultural values just by asking people why because values are socially desirable and people will say something but actually believe in something else so what people say they value are called espoused values and what people truly value are called enacted values and what is important as far as the organization culture is concerned not something which they say but something which will which they be actually believe in so espoused values do not represent the organization culture but they are portrayed in front of the society to create a public image so some organization might you know while while talking with the, with the outsiders or while attending the the owner of the organization while attending outside events might might say a lot of things about valuing people in the organization but in actuality when he comes back to the office he actually shuns the people around dominate tries to dominate them tries to control them tries to insult them so his espoused values and enacted values they are different so in an organization enacted values are more important features of an organization culture so when you are talking of the organization's culture there could be a variety of variety of elements to it variety of things about which you can say this is high and this is low okay so the first thing is alignment what do you mean by alignment alignment like like you know the alignment of the wheel all wheels if they are all aligned together the the car runs smoothly so here we are talking of the alignment in terms of the alignment of individuals in the organization to the goals of the organization are they aligned do they understand what is to be done in the organization do understand how they are you know related to the goals of the organization if that alignment is there the culture is good innovation and risk taking if people are creative how creative are people in the organization how risk taking are people in the organization in certain areas risk taking might be an important virtue in the organization and in certain areas risk taking might not be an important virtue right precision how what kind of precision what kind of um, you know exact results are encouraging are the exact results encouraging the organization or is precision not that valued in the organization people might be outcome oriented people oriented team oriented so is the culture of the organization outcome oriented do we does the organization insist on achieving results does the organization uh, believe in keeping people happy does the organization believe in team work or individual work do they encourage individuals to conflict with each other or do they want people to you know work together and in teams and achieve results uh, with each other is the organization aggressive dominant i mean like you know very volatile kind of or is it stable resilience is a very important term does the organization have the capacity to bounce back after getting in a problematic situation that is also defined that is all that also defines the culture so any organization can be a combination of these the culture of an organization can be a combination of these and it could vary from high to low and ultimately you get an organization with a personality but it is very vague you cannot find out the personality of the organization by asking people or from their written documents you can find out the personality of the organization the culture of the organization but deciphering certain organizational things artifacts okay so we can't see an organization's cultural assumptions values and benefits organization culture can be observed and deciphered indirectly through artifacts So there could be certain things which will help us understand what the organization believes in what is the organization's culture like what are artifacts artifacts are observable symbols and signs of an organization's culture such as the way people are greeted 
the physical layout of the office or the factory, how employees are rewarded. Understanding an organization culture requires painstaking assessment of many artifacts because they are subtle and often ambiguous. And also because you cannot come to a judgment about the organization's culture by observing only one or two things about the organization. So when you observe the organization in various aspects over a period of time, only then you would be in a position to understand what is the culture of the organization like. But still, it is very important. It is the most important thing that the organization can be described as. So there are four board broad categories of art, you know, um, artifacts or things that you can observe about the organization to find out the culture. They are organizational stories and legends. Um, people who work in the organization are aware of certain stories and legends which tell us a story and there is a moral to the story which helps us understand the culture of the organization. Malice in Dallas is an example I've put in here. I came across it in a book which is basically about an airline industry, which is, <clears throat> which used a, you know, uh, a phrase in their ad campaign, which was just plain smart, because it was an aviation industry, just plain smart. Later on, they came to know that plain smart is, is an ad campaign or a campaign used by another aviation company. So there was this tussle and there could have been a legal, uh, you know, uh, problem there. But the CEO of this first airline, what he did, he got in touch with the other CEO and they decided to have an arm wrestling match in a place in Dallas. So a lot of people, you know, had that arm wrestling match. Even the CEOs, they together had an arm wrestling match. Someone had to be carried away in a stretcher actually at the end of the match. But ultimately, the aviation, the first aviation company CEO, they they, you know, they did not go ahead and do anything legal and they, you know, designed another ad. But this, the whole, the whole situation and the whole story was observed by a lot of people in both the organizations. They were a part of it. And what was the moral of the story? The moral of the story was the belief in which this first aviation uh, company actually believed. And the belief was that having fun is part of business. So this example of this story actually instilled in the whole in, in the in environment and in the whole organization and all the people that you know even there, if there was a problem, you had fun and they were you know and, and they were back to business as usual. This kind of a lesson could not have been given to them, you know, in 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 writing or. It, it, it would have been difficult to make them understand. But then because of such a situation like this, they, the CEO was in a position to, you know, um, download that information, download that thing about the culture of the organization to the employees of the organization. Rituals and ceremonies. There's also an example, a, a, a example I came across. This is about an individual who joined Digital Computer, a firm called Digital Computer. I'm not sure from where, but then yes, the, the example is more important than the place and the organization. And he observed that, you know, in this new organization, he came from an organization which was very silent and very, you know, calm and composed. And this organization, in this organization, people were always shouting at each other and pushing, you know, and making their points clear, always arguing, getting into arguments. So it was a culture shock to him. But then later on, someone told me that that was a ritual at digital computer, that whenever you have some kind of a difference of opinion, you are going to fight it out. Fight it out and try to prove that you are right. And then ultimately, whoever is right will, be, will win and the other person would accept that decision. So this was a ritual there at digital computer, which 
maybe help them vent out, also help them, uh, you know, push back people. And ideas were challenged and ideas were proved. So rituals are programmed routines of daily culture, daily organization life that dramatize the organization's culture. Similarly, more formal artifacts or more formal uh, uh, rituals could be ceremonies, like award ceremonies, which are conducted for an audience. Rituals and ceremonies and events like this, they help the audience or people who are related understand the culture of that place, how they are designed, how they are conducted. It's all according to the culture of the place, right? The language in the organization, the phrases, the words, they also depict the culture of the organization, how employees address the co-workers, how they describe the customers, how they express anger, greed other stakeholders are all verbal symbols of cultural values. There are certain <clears throat> phrases and words which are used by the organization leaders also, which unconsciously instill the culture in the people or the employees of the company. For example, if the leader always uses the term we or empowerment or customer satisfaction, what are the employees going to imbibe? We talks of teamwork, empowerment, talks of empowerment of the employees. Customer satisfaction tells them that customers are most important and somehow directly, indirectly, consciously, subconsciously, these values are instilled in the employees. And that is how the culture of the place comes into. We can understand the culture and even the culture is built like that. Physical structures and symbols. Buildings, their shapes, the shape of the workplace, the structures, the location, the way the offices are designed, the space, the chairs, whether they are very rigid structures or whether they are, you know, the kind of the kind of uh, quotations, the kind of wall hangings, the pic pictures which are there on the walls, the artifacts which are there, the reception area of the office, all these suggest the company's emphasis on, on certain qualities. Could be any quality. And there's a very good um, quote I found. It says that we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So where we are working, that is a very good indicator of what kind of culture is existing there. Now, how many, how do you, Think that many modern organizations display innovativeness or team oriented culture or egalitarian culture. The new offices that are designed of most modern companies, they give space to the workers. You can, you know, you can keep your stuff somewhere. There's an office which I, the, the example of an office which I came across where they used to, they, they, uh, they are hanging their cycles up, you know, at the, on the ceiling using pulleys. Uh, whatever, what, a lot of creative work they are doing there. So they have this freedom to do whatever they want to do. So what is that, what is, what is that kind of office space? What does that kind of office uh, arrangement tell us? That there is an innovative culture, there is a free culture, right? And uh, obviously most of the American firms, they follow an egalitarian culture where uh, everyone is equal in the, in the, in the office. But not that, not, that kind of culture does not majorly exist here in, in a place like India. I'm not sure about um, where you are right now. What kind of culture exists in offices? Anyway, so uh, what are the functions of an organization culture? How important is an organization culture? Every company has a culture, whether good or bad. It comes from within and it takes time to create. And obviously, the person who is most importantly responsible or the people who are most importantly responsible for the formulation of organizational culture, I would not say formalization, but creation of the organization culture are the top management people. Because their beliefs, their values lead to whatever is, done being, is being done in the organization. 
they would pick up individuals or pick up employees who 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 are somehow related to their values and their beliefs so the the culture of the organization is created in this manner Cul so culture is one of the most important and precious things a company has so you must work harder on it than anything else there are three important functions that the culture does one it is a form of social control on employees because you would like to behave when you go to a new place you would behave in a manner which is consistent with the others okay so somehow the culture is you would not behave which is you know entirely uh, apart or entirely differently from the people with whom you are sitting in the office so social control is ensured by culture social identity is also ensured by culture where people internalize the organization's culture and they become like that and that becomes their identity and that social identity also keep keeps people together because everyone wants to display the same kind of uh beliefs values attitudes thirdly it assists in the sense making process whatever happens in the organization the employees is employees able to make sense out of it and you know because we believe because the culture says this because the organization believes in this that is why this thing is happening and uh, they don't spend time trying to figure out why what is expected of them what has happened you know that kind of thing so it's, it assists in sense making because they know that because this is the culture of the organization this thing is taking place and i'm expected to work in this manner how do you strengthen the organization culture the organization culture is strengthened by the founders of the organization by the actions of the founders of the organization uh by giving rewards people for, of people who are aligned aligned with the culture of the organization by maintaining a stable workforce why because people learn the culture and people who are there in the organization for a long term, long num long number of years they would train the others in the culture of the organization managing the cultural network networking with similar kind of organization similar kind of people that will strengthen the organization culture selecting and socializing employees selecting good people and also ensuring that you select people according to the culture of the organization and then ensuring that they are socialized in the culture also that will strengthen the organization culture so that brings us to the topic of socialization what is socialization how it is done i think you understand what is socialization we have been if we all come together the people who are attending the, attending this meeting right now if we all come together one day and uh, we sit in one place we would have different viewpoints we would have different uh, uh behaviors culturally we are all different in some manners in some manners we are similar why has that happened that has happened because we've been brought up in different cultures and we have been socialized in that manner our parents our families our society our community has taught us things which the other societies are not learning okay so that is socialization learning process socialization is both a learning and a adjustment process learning process because in the organization the newcomers learn the so the the dynamics in the place the environment of the place the expectations of the organization the team dynamics the power dynamics the corporate culture they learn a lot of things in socialization and they also learn to make adjustments because individuals need to adapt to this new work environment right so this effective socialization actually helps individuals in the organization to adapt to the culture of the organization and be able to perform give me a sec
So what is what are the three stages of socialization? The three stages of socialization of an employee are pre-employment socialization. When an employee is actually selected in one place, you know, uh, it, this socialization, you know, the same process is, happens everywhere. But as of now, we are talking of the socialization of uh, individuals in the organization. So when, a, when an employee is selected, that employee would, you know, search some information, talk to friends, he'll find out literature, he will, uh, you know, search for some online information. Since he has been to the interview, uh, he will use some information which was discussed in the interview and form expectations and anticipations. Expectations about what will what he will find and anticipation about what he has to do. Right? And sometimes it is distorted. It is not reality because this person has not joined the organization till now. He will have different kinds of, you know, opinions about the organization and expectations, which might not be real. So that is pre-employment socialization. Finding information which might be true, which might not be true. Second stage of socialization is encounter. When this then when this employee goes to the organization for the first day, he may get a reality shock if his expectations and his, if his judgment about the organization was not correct. He will definitely find a discrepancy but between the pre-employment expectation that he had and the job reality. That reality shock can occur either in one day or it can take months to occur. Why does that reality shock happen? Because he's overwhelmed by the job. He is not very comfortable with what culture is existing there. Uh, he, you know, the management has not pro fulfilled the promises. The working style is not good. The people he does not like there. You know, a, a whole lot of causes can be there. But it definitely comes as a shock because no one can judge the culture of a place completely. Okay. So he's get, he gets a reality shock. Now, if he's able to overcome that reality shock, he will stick to the job. And he'll reach the third stage, which is the role management. Role management is the stage when the employee survives the reality shock, settles in, makes transition from a newcomer to insider, strengthens the relationship with the co-workers and superiors, practices the new role behaviors, and adopts the attitudes and values consistent with the new position in organization. So he is making adjustments and trying to fit into the role which has been given to him. And if this employee remains in the role for quite some time, he becomes an insider. He becomes a person who is a part of the culture and someone who is reflecting the culture. And it goes on like that. Okay. So that was what? That was the socialization process. That brings us to the end of the small discussion that we had about the organizational culture. I think we are clear on that. Yes, madam. Okay. Yes, doctor. Thank you. Yeah, it's clear, Paul. Okay, yes, so let's come to the, thank you. Let us come to the next topic which is unit 13 and it talks about organizational change this topic is important because whatever has been done till date in the organization the management process leadership motivation um form formation of the you know forming the culture developing the culture of the organization before that, we were talking of some other topic, which is uh, so whatever the whole, the, whatever functions are done in the organization may lead to results, may not lead to results. When they lead to results, good enough, you know, the functions go on smoothly. But sometimes there are certain elements of the organization which become difficult to manage and which need to be changed. Or for that matter, change is evident. So there would be changes in the organization also. And we need, we as management people need to know how to manage change. Because since we have built the organization with so much of effort, 
like we just discussed culture culture is made after you know culture is developed over a long period of time with care but sometimes if there are some elements in the culture which are not conducive to the development or the growth of the organization they will have to be changed so we will have to have some mechanism we have to understand the mechanism of change of organizations organization change is the process through which the organization undergoes any transformation internally in its methods structure processes etc it can happen due to a number of reasons and here we would focus on planned change brought about by the organization there could be certain things which were un which are unplanned and which the organization has to handle but here we are talking of the planned change so, so for example if there is a threat in the organization threat to the uh, existence of the organization that is unplanned and we are not looking at that kind of change right now we are looking at the need we are looking at the change which is planned okay and uh, before coming to the need before coming to how we are going to change we have to understand why we need to change we would need to change because there are major changes in the environment external environment the major changes in technology major changes in workforce which can make the existing structure practices culture or technologies obsolete forcing the organization to make changes let us look at what happened during covid 19 a major change in the external environment occurred when people were uh, forced to adapt to a different environment most of the organizations adopted a different technology people were not traveling they were using online meetings people were not having conferences on the online teaching was online right so there was that's a made that was a major change in the external environment the coming of uh, uh, the 5g technology the coming of uh, electric electric vehicles that's a major change in technology that will force us to say change certain things in the organization workforce is becoming more uh, diverse so we have to make our policies inclusive all that is there so the first thing is major changes in the external environment for, for in that case we have to make changes in the organization the second factor is with the growth of the organizations it's sometimes what happens is its communication decision making systems become choked what we were following till late now becomes irrelevant inefficient ineffective so we have to make changes to the rewards and punishment systems we have to make changes to the um web interpersonal relations are handled in the organization and you know so the the whole there's a requirement for the change in the organization okay there's a very important theory which is connected with um the second factor that we talked of that with the growth of an organization its communication and decision making systems become choked let me uh, uh, give me a minute to identify exactly as to how much portion is left and uh, how much time would be required to complete it and then i'll come back to this presentation we'll take half a minute uh oh, not me sure at all i think it's it will be easily done okay so this model by larry e greener's growth model it shows us how an organization grows and during this growth how many times the organization has to change so obviously the change will be over a long period or over a you know can happen many more times but this is majorly about only five phases of growth that he's depicted okay Okay. 
I am not a... Oh, sorry. Anyway, I wanted to just reduce the size, but I'm not able to do it while the presentation is on. So let just, let's just keep it like this. I think you can see it here. No. Okay, now I see it. Five. Yes. Okay, according to this theory, With the age of the organization, the size of the organization grows. And as the size of the organization grows, there are various problems which come in between. These are called moments of crisis. So when the organization is very small, it will start growing. Slowly, there will be a crisis situation called crisis of leadership, where people initially they were happy, but later on, they don't want that kind of a leadership which has been followed till now, which is like, you know, more um, authoritarian. Right. This uh, this uh, when this crisis is sorted out, the problem of and this uh, organization grows again after some time, it has a crisis of autonomy. Where people now want freedom. After some time, when they are given freedom and the organization starts growing again, and after some time, since they have been given freedom, there will be a problem of control because they would start doing things on their own. As the organization grows, as this problem is sorted out and the organization grows, there's a problem of red tapeism. It is called the crisis of coordination. Further on it grows, there's a crisis of collaboration. There are, this theory is very interesting. You have to go ahead and read, do a little bit of extra reading on this. But this shows that as the organization grows, there are various crisis situations in between. Because of the size of the organization, and these have to be sorted out by different strategic inputs or interventions. Okay. So, what does the manager do to bring about a planned change? An effective manager does not, what are the two factors on, on the basis of which change is required? We discussed it uh, in the initial part of this, that there are outside changes. There are certain things, certain circumstances which force us to change. And because of the growth of the organization also, we have to change. So there are two conditions because of which change becomes imperative. Now, so an effective manager does not let change happen as it is. He initiates a planned change strategy for this and which has three components. So the Change strategy has three components. One, the dimension of change, deciding what needs to be changed. Second, the process of change. And three, the third, the introduction of change. And these three phases have, have different sub phases. Dimension of change means that what needs to be changed in the organization. The organization has task or work does it need to be changed? Structure, does it need to be changed? Technology, people, what is to be changed? Now, since the task of an organization is assumed to be given because they will not, uh, you know, change the business, the task is going to be the same. However, task change and also can also be sometimes through deletion and addition of some tasks. Like uh, if you remember, if the business is maybe uh, reduced to some extent or it, you know there's some other uh, kind of work added to the business it would lead to task task change structural change means like we discussed the organization structure above it includes defining rules and relationships and responsibilities redefine so there are a whole lot of things which we can do to change the structure of the organization. Technology change, improving the current technology or improving the workers efficiency, better coordination, better plant layout, all these are technological changes and behavior change. Again, it can have a whole variety of things. So what are we talking of? The first stage when we are thinking of change is the dimension or what needs to be changed. So we might need to make some changes as far as people are concerned. We might need to change the 
activities of the organization, the structure of the organization, right? Or the technology used, being used in the organization. So this is to be decided in the beginning as to what is to be changed. Why? Because we need to solve that problem. If there's a problem in the environment or if there is a problem in the internal growth mechanism. So we need to change any of these dimensions. Okay. Now, after we change, after we decide what is to be changed, we would start the process of change. And the process of change has three stages. I'm not going into detail because of the time constraint, but yes, this would be available to you. And in case there are doubts, you can always uh, come back with doubts and we will, we will clear those doubts. The process of change majorly because we need not go into so many details also, that is also there. The process of change is, has three elements, unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. Okay, now what do you mean by unfreezing? We said that people and things, you know, become very rigid over a period of time. So unfreezing is the most difficult phase, wherein there is a resistance to change. If you implement any change in the organization, for example, if you change technology, I think most of the countries we, we belong to, uh, computerization has is a very recent, fairly recent thing. So when you bring computers in the organization, now it is, I suppose, everywhere, but maybe some certain places might not be, uh, you know, technically so advanced. So when, when there is a uh, initiation of using computers in the organization, people will resist because they don't want to learn. They have habits, they have perceptions, they have beliefs, values. They would feel that their jobs will possibly go they will lose their jobs or concern for image because they know that they're not able to learn. They might feel afraid that people will laugh at them, right? Or, or some other conditions might exist, fear of retraining, fear of learning new schools, all kinds of fears. So people have a lot of fears, you know, and the moment you start thinking of making a change, there will be resistance. So unfreezing and making them understand that this is for their own good or this is for the good of the organization, that is a very, the most difficult task. Once that is over, once that resistance is, you know, has been handled, the changing, the actual changing takes place, where it could be participative or directive. They could be told that, no, you have to make this change, or they could be, uh, it could be discussed out with them and they, and they come out with suggestions and then, you know, that kind of thing can happen. But changing is the second phase. What is this? Changing is the second phase. And once the change has been, oh, what is this? Hold on, hold on. I've done something wrong. Okay. Once this change has taken place, you know, computers, computers have been brought in, people have been trained, and uh, some people needed to be directed, some people, you know, were already ready to change. So, and people have started using those computers, but you cannot just leave them now. What will happen is if you don't give them rewards and reinforcements and ensure the change will not be inter internalized. What will happen is they will work on the computers for one week and then leave the computers and start doing manual work. Okay. So any change has to have three phases. One is unfreezing where you're getting the people ready for the change. Second is changing when you're actually implementing the stage. And third is refreezing where you are ensuring over a period of time by the by, by giving them rewards and reinforcements and further directions and guidance, you're ensuring that the change is there to stay, right? That is the end of organizational change. And the last small topic is I think we'll take five minutes to explain this and then we can take questions. Since this is the uh, last academic counseling, I would request you to be there for uh, five, 10 minutes beyond the regular time so that we are able to finish off the course completely. Okay. Yeah, if you don't react, I start feeling that, you know, um, 
your I've lost connection of the network. Yes, ma'am, we are following. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's come to the last topic, which is corporate social responsibility. Now, corporate social responsibility is a management concept whereby companies integrate social and environmental concerns with their business operations and interactions with their stakeholders. Okay. It is very important to understand that CSR is actually a little different from the charity or sponsorships or philanthropy that the organization does. Reason being that uh, the philanthropy, you know, the philanthropic activities or the charity that the organization does enhances the uh, reputation of the organization but the concept of csr is more you know it goes beyond that and a properly implemented csr concept can bring along a variety of competitive advantages basically csr is not just charity or not just uh, for the social cause csr uh, is basically about enhancing the image of the organization for the purpose of being able to do better business Okay, types of social response, corporate social responsibility basically are of four categories. So it could be environmental responsibility, philanthropic responsibility, ethical responsibility, or economic responsibility. Okay. You now, you know, the environment is in the focus nowadays. So environmental responsibility, you must be quite aware of. It is the most common forms of CSR activities. And uh, here, the what is the organization trying to do? The, co the organization will try to reduce harmful practices, decrease pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, will not use single-use plastics, water consumption, general waste, you know, circulation of water, waste handling, all those things the organization will try to do responsibly for environmental responsibility. They will also regulate energy consumption and maybe rely more on the renewables if they are available. They will use recycled or partially recycled materials and also try to offset the negative environmental impact by doing certain activities which help the environment directly. Planting trees, donating to related causes. Okay. Ethical responsibility is another form of CSR responsibility. Uh, it could be, you know, operating in a fair and ethical manner. And it is not necessarily uh, by, it could be, you know, fair treatment to all stakeholders, including leadership investors, employees, suppliers, and customers. An example could be paying a higher wage to your employees, getting your material sourced from uh, responsible suppliers, Ensuring that you don't uh, employ child labor, all these are ethical things. Philanthropic responsibility. Here you are trying to make the society a better place. A philanthropy could be uh, investing in education, welfare, which has a positive impact on the society. Economic responsibility is to ensure that all financial decisions are based on firm's commitment to do good. The end goal is not just to maximize profit, but also to ensure that the business operations positively impact the environment, people, and society. So employment, training, this is a part of economic responsibility. Now, what are the benefits of CSR activities? What are the benefits of corporate social responsibility? Now, majorly they do it because of moral conviction, the organizations, but it can be a very powerful marketing tool also. There are three benefits if you look at it that way. One, it is a powerful marketing tool because you become favorable in the eyes of, you know, they eye you favorably, the customers, the investigators, the regulators, the public. It also helps in employee engagement because nowadays a lot of people are attracted to this kind of concepts. And employee engagement and satisfaction, if, if CSR activities lead to employee engagement and satisfaction, they also oh, are measures that drive retention. 
if you are if the personal convictions or the personal values of individuals or employees working in the organization or otherwise elsewhere they are very clearly you know associated with the values of the organization people would like to join such an organization and then be committed to the organization also the third thing is that it inherently forces the business leaders to examine their practices processes and procedures so when the organization starts working on the csr it takes take csr initiatives the people in the organization will start questioning processes which are harmful to the society practices which are not good for the society uh, for the environment so all these things would be there and this has not been there for a long long time businesses were utilizing the essence of the nature or people you know unethically and they were these practices were not there so nowadays with, with the on with the coming of the csr initiatives organizations have started thinking on those directions okay and this reflection can also can often lead to innovative and ground breaking solutions that help a company act in more socially responsible ways and increase profits one concept which is always mentioned in um, csr very closely related to csr is triple bottom line what is the bottom line of business earning profit but this is about three p's and what are the three p's the three p's are profit people and planet so the triple bottom line is a business concept that states that firms should commit to measuring their social and environmental impact in addition to their financial performance rather than solely focusing on generating profit or the standard bottom line so when according to the triple bottom line businesses need to focus on profit along with the people and the planet okay i think that is the end of this topic here there are other inputs also which can be given but i'll hold them as of now and i would invite questions as to what has been covered and the complete syllabus as such okay are you there all of you yes we are here madam yes doc we are here Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, so fine. now I'm yeah. open to questions, and um, since this is the end of the syllabus, I would uh, request you if you want to have, you know, if you have any questions, you can please go ahead with uh, them. You can put down the chat box, and we can have a final interaction before 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 we, you know. say goodbye until we meet in the next session uh let me look at the earlier questions and then in the meanwhile you can just think about what all you would like to ask and and another thing i have spoken to your ma'am uh, smriti ma'am and what we'll do is i'll you know these you wanted to pres these presentations so i'm going to make a concise you know compact file of these uh, notes and i'm going to send it to ma'am and she would be able to circulate it with you guys you guys you are great group for that thank Sorry? you ma'am thank you you are great group for that you have money take out your phone download 1 to spend 100 dollars cash bonus on the first day of the session and i'll draw cash auto pay back Well, my PayPal really got $100. Policies and procedures are also be the means of motivation definitely. Definitely they can. Uh procedures maybe a little Francis could you please mic yeah mute yourself. Procedures would uh, to some extent they can but policies definitely um can definitely have an impact on the motivation levels of people because uh HR policies policies are an indication actually of what the organization believes in and uh, if they are not according to the expectations of the individuals they would not be motivated they would they would definitely find uh, it difficult to work where the policies are not according to their expectations 
and maybe some policies are not conducive to proper work. But this is the tussle that goes on in organizations because um, the managers might not understand the impact of some policies which are harmful possibly. But then if there's an open culture and open communication in the organization and the, there, are, there are chances of uh, there is an opportunity for the subordinates to, you know, give feedback, raise grievances of some sort, then this can be sorted out. I think that's Salome, if that should be a, to some extent an answer to your question. Now let's look at, um, if you have a question, could you please uh, send it again so that you know uh, if it's gone up somewhere. Okay. Uh, motivation factors, Richard is asking, motivation factors have changed over time due to various societal, cultural, technological. Uh, this is an answer, not a question. Okay. Yes. And um, are these needs in McLean's inherent or acquired? Uh, I'll have to go through the A moment. Needs can be both. They can be acquired and they can be inherent. Needs actually are because you, you know, whatever motivates you, it no, is is not necessarily what you have acquired. It could be an inherent need also. And needs keep on changing. Just give me a second. I need to look because I keep on. I have to look at the name of the. MacLean's need for achievement theory. These are generally inherent. Yes. Trevor, basically, they are inherent. These are inherent needs. Okay, how do you apply McLean's theory to the workplace? You have to like, you know, like the judging the culture of the organization is through observations. The needs in the McLean's uh, theory are also observed. They have to be found out as to who is. And if you observe people for over a long period of time, you would be in a position to understand what is it that they want. Do they need do they want achievement? Are they focused on achievement? Are they focused on control or are they focused on affiliation? So people who are focused on affiliation would most probably spend a lot of time talking to their colleagues and uh, being concerned about their colleagues. So you can make out. And uh, this way you are in a position to understand what all needs are motivating an individual. And then you will be able to apply to a workplace because you know the requirements of the job and you know the uh, you know the needs of the individual so you have to match so anyone who is like we said anyone who's who has whose need for affiliation is greater would be more apt to do a job in a place where you know they have to be more compassionate more communicative more concerned more sensitive to the requirements of of other people that way. So you can apply McLean's theory to the workplace in that sense. Uh, Vroom, that's expectancy. He is going to be promoted. I think that's also an answer. I don't see what is the name of this book. Which book are you talking of? Ismail. Makaji, the network is OK. I suppose I'm not sure about the others, but I, I have not heard anyone complaining about the network today. So or is, is, is it a problem at my end? 
now nothing can be done because now it's almost over okay so you were talking you you guys were chatting with each other not much use socialize is the process of learning from birth to death yes definitely but uh, socialization generally happens in the formative years uh, if you look at it if you if you you know go through some psychological uh, articles uh, you'll get to know that uh, your personality is frozen by the time you are 18 and after that you make very little changes to the basic core personality so the core of the personality is frozen by the time you are 18 so you can change certain things you can learn new things but you cannot change your basic personality after that and before that you are, you can have some some control Mustafa, I am not taking uh, human resources management. I am taking management functions and organizational processes. The subject is that, but definitely documents, the presentation and the uh, notes you will get later on. But that will be through the right channel. corporate social responsibility is not a must but it is legally required in some places to spend some part of the uh, profit on it as per law but it depends on uh, country to country definitely can the question is can organizational culture also contribute to less staff retention definitely organization culture is a concept which is not completely and truly understood by a lot of firms and not many firms actually pay attention to the development of organization of proper positive organizational culture so there could be a very volatile organizational culture there could be very uh, dominant organizational culture there could be very aggressive organizational culture and in cultures like this people might not find you know uh, very conducive to their own personal growth they are not able to uh, adjust to cultures like this and obviously retention is going to be a problem in such cases yes organizational culture does depend on the style of leadership actually it is in fact uh, when we were talking of strengthening of the um, organizational culture there was one point that it depends on the leaders because like we said the starting point of the organizational culture the formation of the organic culture organizational culture is through the top management the founder and the whole culture of the organization is the starting point again if you talk about it is about is is you know from the mission and the vision of the organization so it you know trickles down from the top of the organization so leaders play an important role and the leadership side definitely plays an important role in, in the formation of the culture um theories for each can you please okay that all the content is already coming uh, thank you on uh, i think that is uh, the end of the text messages uh, it's already been a yeah it's already been a we've gone beyond time over time so it's 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 been wonderful uh, you know interacting with you i hope you will be in a position to do your assignments well and your examinations also and i'm also hopeful of meeting you in the next semester okay so have a good day and uh, please go through your study material and whatever observations you have in case please tell your uh, coordinator and the notes would i would uh, require a couple of days to you know compile them then i would definitely be sending it through ma'am
So don't worry about that. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. It's been a wonderful lecture.